Our next speaker is one of the co-founders of Software Mill, uh, where he codes mainly using Scala and other interesting uh, technologies. He's involved in uh, open source projects such, such, uh, such as uh, ECTB, Tepire, um, Quick Lens, Elastic MAQ, and others. He has been a speaker at major conferences such as Java One, Lambda Conf, uh, DevOx, and Scala Days. Um, well, apart from writing closed and open source uh, software, uh, in his free time, he tries to read the internet on various functional programming related subjects. Um, well, any ideas or insights usually end up with a blog. Um, well, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, actually um, see his blogs on softwaremail.com slash blog. Do not worry, I'll be providing you with the, the important links via Discord. Also, you can post your questions. Well, Adam will be taking them right after the session in the special chat room. Uh, enjoy the talk and do not forget to spread love and happiness. Well, Adam, the floor is full yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, I can take over the screen sharing, I assume. Uh, yes. OK, desktop one, share. Okay, I hope you can see the IDE clearly. Good. So uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, good morning or good evening, depending where you are. Mm, my name is Adam Warski, and uh, I would like to talk today a bit about modeling HTTP endpoints as data and exposing HTTP endpoints as data um, we are continuing the subject of immutable data structures of functional programming, which was the topic of the previous session. So that's actually uh, some good continuity here. And um, so we will be uh, actually using Scala as our host language um, because some of the features, some of the type safety that the type library that we are going to use require the use of some Scala features that are not available in Java. But the, my main goal here would be to show you a practical example of functional programming, uh, how functional programming can actually improve the status quo when it comes to exposing HTTP endpoints and modeling uh, this kind of technical concepts. So even though the examples will be in Scala and I don't expect you to understand all of the Scala code, I would just like to, uh, to convey the idea of how you can use the, these immutable data structures and all of these features uh, to your benefit in other domains, not only when it comes to domain HTTP endpoints. Okay, so with that introduction, let's maybe f start by taking a look at the current state, um, state of art in, in Java. So if you are exposing an HTTP endpoint in Java, chances are quite high that you are going to use some kind of annotations to, uh, to mark uh, the points, the entry points uh, uh, into how the HTTP requests should be translated into method calls. So um, if you're using Spring or JEE, this will look probably quite similar. So um, here, for example, we have a, a method that should be called whenever a GET request for this uh, particular path is, uh, is invoked. And we see that uh, this method produces a JSON, right? And uh, probably this book over here, this book instance should be serialized uh, to, uh, to JSON as a response. So this works quite well. Um, we have probably everybody had some kind of experience if, if, if you've been doing uh, Java and, and web programming in Java. But there are some drawbacks to annotations, uh, which maybe we can somehow address. So uh, just to quickly summarize uh, some of them. So first of all, the language of annotations is very poor. So it's a very basic language. So annotations are kind of an, uh, glued on addition into Java. So we have the regular Java language and we have the language of annotations. Uh, the type safety in, in annotations is very limited. Uh, we can only you know, pass in string, ints, and so on as uh, parameters, so not complex objects. So, um, and uh, uh, we are often ending up with uh, string typed, uh, with strings which uh, convey some expressions. So for example, here we have an ID expression which references 
this ID over here, right? But uh, the fact that this ID is the same uh, over here and over here, well, it, it's not checked by the compiler in a way, right? These are just strings. So we have to resort either to IDE support. You can see that actually IntelliJ has some support for these kind of patterns here. Um, or we have to resort to runtime uh, checking. Um, and actually, if we think about annotations, annotations are a way to program the framework that we are using, to program Spring, to program a JE container. Um, so what we are doing with annotations, we are kind of defining a DSL language, a domain-specific language, using which we are programming uh, the container. And the container then, upon startup, interprets the annotations one by one. So it acts as an interpreter. If there's an error, it, it will actually throw an exception. So, um, so again, here's maybe some area of improvement. Maybe we can actually do some of these checks at compile time. Uh, maybe we can do more work up front. Maybe we can use a, the regular language like Java or Scala instead of a, uh, of a, a poorer language like the language of annotations, which doesn't allow any kind of abstractions or it doesn't allow, uh, you know, for example, uh, having conditionals or uh, even extracting a common set of annotations into, into a function or, or something like this. <clears throat> so that's the current state of the art. And let's see if we can actually improve that. Uh, that said about annotations, they are still uh, very good in many ways. For example, readability is a very important concern, right? If you look at, uh, at the set of annotations that we have over here, you can more or less understand what is the intention of the author of the code. So that's a characteristic that we definitely want to retain. So the general idea here would be to describe our endpoints, not using annotations, but using a data structure, a data structure like any other data structure in our code. So you, you probably have like a product data structure, a user, a invoice, something like that, right? And we manipulate these data structures all the time in our systems. So maybe we can do actually the same, uh, but for annotations, for technical concepts, right? And once we model this endpoint using a data structure, um, and once we do that, we can actually get the whole power of our language, be it Java, Scala, or any other language, Kotlin, for example, we get the whole power of the language to actually manipulate these data structures. So then we will try to convert these data structures to a server or convert these to a documentation, uh, like open API documentation or a client with uh, which we can call an, uh, some other server. So that's, that's, the, that's the general idea that we are going to pursue. Um, before uh, continuing a short introduction, why would I actually be uh, a good person to talk to you about HTTP APIs? So I guess I've been, uh, as many of you over here, uh, I've been doing backend programming for a long time and backend programming necessarily involves creating HTTP APIs. So I started with Java, J2E, JBoss Seam. Uh, this was a project long time ago, quite popular at that time. I've been using Spring, then I moved to Scala uh, using Lyft, HTTP, HTTP4S, and now I'm uh, writing my own library Tapir, which builds upon uh, some of these other libraries uh, and provides a programmer-friendly API to describing endpoints. And we will be going to use uh, to we will going to we are going to use this um, this project over here. They, they, I'm a <clears throat> software engineer and a CTO at Software Mill, which is a, company uh, doing custom software and consulting um, in Java, Scala, Kafka, Cassandra, many other interesting technologies. We've been remote for 10 years now. So we've been kind of prepared for this uh, remote first uh, work setup. Um, and yeah, I invite you to, to, to read our blog. We publish quite a lot of interesting articles. Okay, but now let's get to, uh, to the live coding and the demos the demo, which is the main part. So what we are going to do is we are going to write a, a couple of simple endpoints which will manipulate a list of books. So here we have uh, our uh, domain uh, data structure, a book, right? It's a case class. If you know Java uh, records, it's a very similar thing. So it's like a data class. It's immutable uh, and it's um, uh, very easy to create. So we've got this uh, case class book. We also have uh, something like a database. So this is a, a demo. So we are only going to have an in-memory database using a variable, which is a very bad idea in production because it's thread unsafe, but here it, it should work just fine. And we have a list of example books just so we have some example data. So let's first 
uh, describe our endpoints. So we will start by describing the structure of the endpoints. So we will only focus on how the endpoints should look like, not how should they behave. So the first endpoint that we are going uh, to model is going to be an endpoint to add a new book to our database. So it will correspond to a posting some data to books slash add. So what we are going to do is we are going to take an empty endpoint description. So this endpoint value that I'm referencing here comes from uh, this uh, Tapir library. And it's an empty description of an endpoint. It's an endpoint without any constraints, without anything mapped from the request and without anything mapped to the response. And now we are going to specialize this empty description, adding more, more data. So this is going to be a post endpoint. So there's a dot post method, which actually specifies as a constraint that this, this endpoint only works for post requests. Uh, then we are going to add uh, some more inputs. So we are going to say that this should work uh, only if the path is books slash add books. And um, then we are going to require that the input is a JSON body, which should be parsed as a, as a book. Um, and we are also going to require a header. Uh, which is going, which we are expecting to be a string, uh, an authentication token, uh, so that not everybody can actually add a book. Um, okay, so these are the inputs. So these four inputs over here specify the constraints or the mapping between the, the request and our, uh, and what we want to extract from the request, right? We want to extract a book instance from the body, a header, and we also constrain the path and the method with which the endpoint can be invoked. Now, what's the output? Well, in case of an error, right? Uh, endpoints typically have very different uh, return, different shapes of data in case of errors and in, in the case of success. So in the case of an error, we return a string body, just a description of an error with status code 400 or something like that. And in case of success, uh, yeah, in case of success, we just return, we, we don't return any, anything specific, we will just return 200 okay which is the default okay and we will actually assign this to a value so that's like a constant add book um, and uh, th that's the whole description of our endpoint we can actually now uh, generate the type for that uh, for that endpoint and let's see what it contains so we can see that the type of our value is an endpoint we can go to the definition of this endpoint class again that's from the type library we can go to definition and you can see that the endpoint class is a case class. So it's like, again, like a Java record, a data class, an immutable data class. And it contains a couple of fields. We have the inputs. So these are the things that map to the HTTP request. We have the error outputs. So these are the things that map to the response in the case of an error. And we have regular outputs and some uh, metadata here as well. So that's a regular a completely normal data structure, just as you have a user, a product, an invoice, we have an endpoint as well, right? And when we call this dot in methods and the dot error out method, what we are doing is we are actually uh, modifying, we are creating a new immutable endpoint description, which uh, has <clears throat> the given input uh, as an addition to the list of inputs al already defined, right? So here we are adding four inputs and one error output. Uh, these inputs themselves are also immutable values. So this is the, the header, for example. This is a method which returns a description of a, of a header that we are expecting to read from the, from the request. In a similar way, we can uh, describe an endpoint for uh, list books. And uh, this will be, we are starting with the empty endpoint, and this will be a get endpoint. And we are uh, we will want to filter the books by year. So here we will uh, create a query parameter, uh, which will be an optional end. So in Scala we don't use nulls; we use optional values. Uh, there's optional in, in Java, so that's the same concept. And this is uh, the name of the parameter is going to be year. Another one will be limit, so that's limiting the request, uh, the, the listing by the number of, uh, so we want to limit the number of results. In case of an error, uh, we return a string body. And in case of success, we return a JSON body, which will be a list of books. Okay, we can again add the type annotation over here. And again, it's an endpoint. 
Okay, so now let's look at the type parameters that we have here. The first type parameter of our endpoint data structure describes the values that we extract from the request, right? So in this case, we extract a book instance from the body and the string from the header. In this endpoint here, we extract two optional ints from these query parameters. The second type parameter specifies the uh, output in case of an error. So here it's always a string, right? So this corresponds to this. And the third type parameter uh, corresponds to the value that's returned in case of success. So here it's a unit. A unit is a type with a single type uh, with a single member, which is a unit, which is a, a unit. Yeah. Um, and here it's a list of books. And we don't have to worry about the fourth type parameter uh, for now. OK, so we've got our endpoints described. So now let's actually implement. Uh, so, and this is ju just the description of the endpoints. Now let's add some behavior to these endpoints, right? So we will move over here to add these descriptions. So what we will do is we will take the uh, add book endpoint, and we are going to specify the server logic that should be invoked when this endpoint is is invoked. So here uh, we can actually see that IntelliJ tells us that we have to provide a function which takes a book and the authentication header and returns either an error or a unit meaning success. And either is a type which can have a value on, on the left here, an instance of a string and or a value on the right here, an instance of a unit. So it's either of two values. So we can say that uh, here's a, either a book or the authentication token, right? And uh, we can say that if the token isn't a secret, which is uh, very advanced security, then we return uh, a left, meaning an error, unauthorized uh, access. And otherwise, if it's uh, if the token is equal to secret, uh, we simply add the book to our database. Uh, so uh, this over here creates a new list by prepending uh, this instance to this list. So that this creates a new list which has the given book as the first element, and we return a write uh, which is a unit. So we, here this will be success. One more thing that we have to do here is that uh, the server logic over here actually expects uh, these computations to be potentially asynchronous if we are going to call a database. So we are going to wrap all of this in the future. Uh, here we are only doing synchronous things, but uh, like by, 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 uh, by default, we are ready for the fact that uh, things might be asynchronous. And that's the add book uh, server endpoint. In a similar way, we can implement the uh, list books server endpoint, which is uh, list books server logic. Again, here you can see that this is all type safe. Uh, the function that we have to provide here is has to be of uh, has to conform to these types as specified in our description. So that's the type safety that we are using here. So here we've got the mm, the year and the limit filters. And again, we are wrapping everything in the future. So the first thing that we are going to do is we are going to filter the books by year. Filtered books, uh, year, match, uh, case none, we just take all of the books. If there is a year filter, uh, we take the books and we filter them by the year, by the given year. And uh, now uh, limited, maybe let's scroll up a bit. Uh, limited books, uh, we take the limit and we match on it. If there is no limit, we just return uh, the filtered books, if there is a limit, uh, we take the filtered books, uh, take uh, and we return always access. Uh, we, here we, we always return a success, which is the limited books. Okay, so now we've got two values. Each of these values contains the description of the shape of the endpoint and the server logic which should be invoked when the endpoint is actually invoked. So now what we have to actually expose it to the outside world. And here, Tapir only provides the API to describe the endpoints uh, and to actually expose things to you know, managed connections, bind sockets, parse HTTP requests. We are going to use a third party library. We can use ACK HTTP, Play, HTTP4S, Vertex, uh, Finatra. There's uh, quite a lot of choices. Here we are going to use, um, 
here we are going to use uh, Akash TDP. So we are going to create a list of these uh, two endpoints, um, add book and list server endpoints. And we are going to convert them to Akka routes. Akka routes is like, it's, uh, that's a concept coming from Akka. And uh, once we have an Akka route, so that's the type over here that comes from Akka, we can actually expose it as a server. And you can see that this, uh, th these routes are used down here. So over here, we have the actual binding takes place where we take, uh, we bind a new socket and we specify that these are the routes that should be exposed. So these routes, we take our endpoint descriptions, we couple them with the server logic, and then we interpret this as a, a lower level concept of the archive HTTP routes. We can do the same with Vertex or with play and, and so on. Okay, so one more thing that we are going to, you, uh, to do is we are also going to expose documentation for our, uh, for our endpoints and we are going to interpret the description. So we are going to take the data structure that describes our endpoints and we are going to interpret it with, with as documentation. We've already interpreted things as a server. So now we are going to do the same using documentation. So we are going to take a list of our endpoint descriptions without the server logic. Uh, list books, list books, list books, and we are going to convert them to open API. So to open API is an extension method coming from this package over here. And it takes a list of endpoint descriptions and converts them to a data structure that uh, is a reification of the open API specification using, using Scala case classes. So this will be books I've read, version one zero. So that's the open API data structure. So the last thing we need to do here is we need to take the open API docs, uh, that's this value over here, and we need to serialize it as a YAML. Because uh, here we have a case class that represents the, op uh, that, uh, represents the open API uh, description and we can then uh, convert it to JSON or to YAML. And so we have now a string representation of our uh, open API docs. So now we can take, for example, the Swagger UI, which is a nice UI for viewing API documentation. And we can use this over here to expose additional routes which expose the Swagger UI. Okay, uh, let's try compiling it. I'm sure there will be some errors. Uh, there's always some errors. And let's see if this actually uh, works or not. Of course. Uh, so here we have to have the compiler uh, either string or list of books uh, because the compiler inference isn't smart enough to um, to figure this out. Okay, work now. So let's let's run the demo. So what's what is happening now is we are starting the server. We are exposing these endpoints along uh, alongside the documentation. So uh, yeah, this should work. So let's now see if we can, uh, okay. So slash docs, uh, okay, okay. Why doesn't this show the Swagger UI for some reason? It's a good question. But you can see that for some reason this should, ah, I didn't specify the, uh, path over here and this will be slash books okay so this was like a catch-all and that's why it didn't work so let's recompile it with the proper path right now um okay so now now we get the swagger ui yeah so uh, what happened was we didn't specify any path so it was like a wildcard path and because this was exposed before the swagger ui this caught all requests so yeah, so we've got the, the UI over here that we've seen and we've got our two endpoints. Uh, what we can do now, uh, before we actually try invoking it, we can add some metadata so that this description is nicer. So what we can do is we can actually enrich the description of our endpoints with examples or with, uh, with descriptions. So uh, for example, we can say that uh, we, maybe we want to uh, describe in more detail the uh, the body of the add book endpoint. So we can say that the JSON body, that here we want a JSON body that's a book and the description of that will be the book to add. And as an example value, we will provide one, an example of a book to add would be 
Pride and uh, Prejudice, which is, of course, published in year 1813. I'm sure everybody knew that. So, um, and we can, you know, provide additional uh, such metadata to all of these uh, values that we are using here. But we are going to use, we are going to do only this one and we try to recompile and restart. And uh, let's see if this is reflected in the API. So here you can see that we now, in the Swagger UI, we now have an example vibe. And so what we can do is we can try invoking the slash books request to actually get all of the books. Let's try without any parameters. And we get all of the books in our uh, library. We can limit the re results to two, for example. And now we only get two books as requested. So this seems to work quite nicely. So what more can we do with such a representation? So one thing that we can do here, we can actually extract some common functionalities into base values and reuse them later. So we might notice because, you know, we are dealing with ordinary data structures, which we can uh, manipulate as any other data structure, right? So what we can do is we can actually take a look at what is common to these two endpoints and maybe some other endpoints in our system as well. So uh, we can create a base endpoint, base endpoint, and we might notice that all of our endpoints actually have the books prefix, the books path prefix over here, right? So we specify that all of our endpoints, that our base endpoints always has the books prefix. We also notice that uh, in case of an error, we always return a string body, right? So here we can say that in case of an error, we return a string uh, body. So, and now we can actually use that base endpoint instead of this starting endpoint over here, right? So this is an empty endpoint. This is our customized starting endpoint. So we can use it over here and we can remove uh, these common things. So uh, because they are no longer needed and yeah, we can, we can, you know, using a very basic refactoring, which is extract value, we extract the common values. We can actually, uh, we can actually apply that in the domain of, of modeling our endpoints. And then, Maybe also, you know, we are using the limit query parameter multiple times. So we can also extract it as a, as a value. So we can specify that we have query limit uh, parameter. So we can assign it to a value and we can use it over here and potentially in other places. We can add a description and the limit um, and so on. So we can use very standard tools when it comes to um, I messed something up with the, why is it red? Okay, it's red for some reason, but let's not worry about that too much. I uh, probably made some stupid mistake. So, um, um, so we can use very standard tools when it comes to abstraction, when it comes to extracting values. And all of the time when we are doing that refactoring, the compiler actually guards us that we are doing the right thing. Oh, it's, yeah, it's uh, caught up. Uh, so if we, you know, changed uh, that we that the limit is actually along over here, now this will stop compiling, right? Because the endpoint over here is specified to contain uh, options and uh, to to ints, not to longs, right? So here the compilation, for example, will fail. Okay, so yeah, let's just see if it actually does fail. Yes, it does fail. It it uh, doesn't work. So um, let's bring it back to working version. Um, so that's just like a very, we've just scratched the surface of what we can actually model with Tapir. Uh, but again, I just wanted to show you the basic idea of how working with immutable data structures can look like in the practice. So uh, you might wonder where is actually functional programming here? Well, we've seen some data structures, but where is FP? So, so yeah, so the basic idea of functional programming is that we have the functions, which are our main uh, main concept which, with which we are working. And these functions, uh, they should operate on immutable data uh, because they shouldn't have side effects, ideally, most of the time anyway. So we, so in a function programming, we, we have functions which manipulate immutable data structures and produce more functions or more data structures and so on and so on. And we've seen quite a lot of these over here. So our data structures were the endpoints 
our functions were the interpreters. So we had the interpreter, the server interpreter, which translated the tap your day endpoint data structure into an ARCA HTTP route, which can then be exposed to the outside world. <clears throat> We've seen an, another interpreter, which allowed us to interpret the uh, tap your endpoint data structure as documentation and expose it. We can do the same with the client. So we can take the endpoint, we can convert it to a client call and then call some uh, server which exposes an API matching this description, right? So, and that is where functional programming actually is. And that's the main idea of functional programming that we have functions which manipulate immutable data structures and other, and other functions. We have also been using a technique here of separating the description of our uh, problem of our domain. So we've described the endpoints and only later we added the interpretation stage, right? So because of this indirection, we actually got quite a lot of additional flexibility. So we've gained, uh, by using this approach, we've gained uh, quite a lot of abstraction capabilities. We can extract common code, again, a very basic refactoring, but we can, we, we can now do it. Uh, we can reuse the endpoints in multiple contexts. I think the code is still understandable. So likewise, as we've seen with annotations, if somebody sees a value add book, which is an endpoint, and you know we have an input which looks like a constant string, so it's probably a path. Uh, then we have an input which is a JSON body, an input which is a, which is a header. I think it's still quite readable and quite easy to understand without having deep knowledge about the library and the language and so on. So I think that's still quite understandable. And um, well, Tapir itself isn't yet complete, but we are getting there. So uh, so so you can expect more developments. But again. My main goal here is to show you the, the concept and the approach and the overall goals of the library, which, uh, which uh, uh, we've been keeping in mind when developing it, is we wanted to put an emphasis on type safety. So that's uh, why we are using Scala. Scala allows us to actually be much more type safe than we can be in, in Java. Uh, we wanted to have programmer fr friendly types. So again, and, uh, you know, if somebody sees an endpoint and, you know, these type parameters, once you actually look over here in the in the desk, uh, in the in the documentation, but you can see that this first type parameter describes the inputs, the errors, the success, and so on. Um, so again, this I think is quite quite readable. Okay, so summing up, we've seen how to uh, describe HTTP endpoints using immutable values in a safe way. Uh, we've seen some syntax that Tapir gives us to actually create the data structure. We've seen a couple of interpreters. We've interpreted our endpoints as a server and as documentation. And we've also talked a bit about the general technique of separating the description of our domain problem. Here, the domain problem is a technical one, modeling HTTP endpoints from its interpretation. If you would like to find out more, uh, this uh, whole code for this presentation is available on GitHub. The library itself is open source. If you would like to keep up and you know uh, uh, get to uh, be up to date when it comes to Scala news, we have a weekly Scala newsletter that comes out every uh, every Thursday. So uh, so yeah, if you would have any questions, uh, I didn't put my Twitter here, but my DMs are open. It's twitter.com probably slash Adam Adam Varsky. So uh, feel free to message me if you would have any questions about functional programming or um, or Scala. And that's all I had. Thank you very much.